Hi, my name is Ted, and this is my talk. I apologize for that. Uh, my son asked me to do that, and the things you do for your kids, you know. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> my, so language is an amazing device. I can use it to say anything. I can tell you unsurprising things, like I'm delighted to be here to give you this presentation, or I can say surprising things, like the Chicago Cubs are the favorites to win the World Series this year. Or even more surprising, I could tell you my hovercraft is full of eels. Okay? <laughs> Language, there are around many thousands of languages around the world, between five and 7,000, depending on how you count. And those are divided around 150 different language families, very diff distinct families. So languages are very different. If you've ever tried to learn a language, you know this, because you have to learn a huge set of sounds, you have to learn a whole new set of words, you have to learn how to put the words together. In my group, we're pursuing kind of the other idea, is that languages are similar. We want to know what makes a language a language. Okay, and so we're pursuing the idea that um, languages are designed for efficient use. And, and uh, we look across a huge range of languages to evaluate that. And I'm going to tell you today about three ways in which we think that languages are designed for efficient use. First, that maybe words are uh, short when possible, so you don't have to say so much. Second, that the way you put the words together, the syntax, is easy on human memory. And third, that language word order is robust to noise in the input. Okay, you're probably thinking, that doesn't seem so surprising that maybe language would be designed for efficient, efficient use, but it's actually uh, very surprising. A lot of very smart people have thought about this for a really long time, and their conclusion is that it's not true. You know, the most famous linguist, Noam Chomsky, for example, he says, if you want to make sure that we never misunderstand one another, for that purpose, language is not well designed because you have such properties as ambiguity. If we want to have the property, the things we'd like to say would come out short and simple, well, it probably doesn't have that property. Chomsky is right that language is very ambiguous. Consider words. Take the word take, for example. If I look it up in a dictionary, there are, in fact, over 20 different entries uh, and seven really different ones. According to my Apple dictionary here, this is just the beginning of it. There's 243 different ways that you can use the word take. Take the sound to. It's either an inflection marker, or it's a preposition, or it's a numeral, or it's a, it's a synonym for also. Take the word insight. There's an ambiguity there, the same exact ambiguity. Uh, and syntax is very ambiguity, the way we order words. Here's a sentence from a headline from a Toronto newspaper from a few years ago. Toronto law to protect squirrels hit by mayor. Is the, is the mayor hitting the squirrels, or is he, is he hitting the law? If you look at a random sentence in a newspaper today, which is around 30 or 40 words long, you'll find it has hundreds or even thousands of possible interpretations. So Chomsky's right. Language is ambiguous. But the argument is actually doesn't go through. It's got a, there's an error there. And the error is that la although language is ambiguous out of context, within context, it's almost always completely disambiguated. So let's go back to the word to. And what we see is that, uh, the word to is disambiguated by the local context. So for example, if I say John went to the store, John wanted, wanted to run, John wanted $2, or Sam wanted some money too, it's disambiguated entirely by the preceding and following context, which is sense I meant. And the same is true for the long sentences in, the diction, in, in a, a newspaper. When you read those sentences, they're completely disambiguated by the local context. So Chomsky's idea for why communication wouldn't be a good explanation for the way that language works does not go through, because language is actually unambiguous in context. It's only ambiguous out of context. So then we can pursue the idea that maybe language is evolved for communication. One way that that might, be, might, might work itself out is that you want to say less. And so more frequent words you might want to make short, and longer words you might make you might, might be less frequent. So, and that turns out to be robustly true. Short words tend to be very high frequency. We say them a lot, like to, take, man, way, was. 
Infrequent words tend to be long, like refrigerator, orangutan, and a reluctant. And that was actually observed by a famous Harvard linguist in the early 40s uh, called George Kingsley Ziff. In my group, we explored an even stronger prediction of the information theoretic account that not just frequency predicts word length, but predictability in context. So you can have a very low frequency word, which might be short if it occurs in the same kinds of contexts over and over again. Turns out that there's lots of examples like that. So words like aback, or bisque, or antler, or wasp, or lipo, or yonder, these words are very low frequency and they're short. The reason they can be short is that they occur in very predictable contexts. A back almost always occurs after a verb, a verb like take or taken. Yonder almost always occurs after a word like over. And so we can use the predictability of the context to keep the code short. We looked at this across 13 languages with huge texts from all those languages, and we find it's robustly true that all languages tend to minimize the word length according to how predictable the preceding two words, the preceding two word context was. So that's a candidate for a cross-linguistic universal, which is information theoretic based. Okay, um, and let's move on now to syntax. Remember this example that I gave you before about the headline? So the Toronto law to protect girls hit by mayor. One interpretation is that he's attacking or criticizing the law, right? But the funny one is the one where he's attacking the, hitting the squirrels. Why do we get that other interpretation? It's because it's a local connection. Whenever you have very local connections between the dependencies of the words, it's very easy for the memory system to compute that, and so you notice them. And so I'm going to give you a few more examples of, here's a bad translation from a Russian monument. You can visit the cemetery where famous Russian composers are buried daily except Thursday. <laughs> There's a local connection there that the writer did not intend, but you can't help but notice because the human memory system really has an easy time with those local connections. What they wanted was this long distance connection back to visit. Okay, and here's a third example. This is from a doctor's medical report. Medical report. Uh, patient reports pain starting near his penis, which goes down to his knee. <laughs> okay, there's a local connection there, which I don't think the doctor intended, they, but you can't help but notice it. The long distance one is the one that he meant, okay? And I'm sorry, I don't have any pictures to disambiguate those two. <laughs> okay, so what we wanted to do next was look across languages. It turns out that these local connections are really easy to make. We wanted to compare how languages actually make connections in the words that they use, in, this, in the sentences that they use, to some baseline. Okay, and this is a project that was led by Richard Futrell, a graduate student at MIT, and what he did was take all the sentences from 37 languages, so this is a sentence from English, a random sentence from English, and he looked at the dependency connections there, and he compared those to the same word string connected in the same way, but with the words scrambled. So instead of the girl kicks the ball, where girl is depending on cook, kicked, it kicks, and ball is depending on kicks, we compare to the girl the ball kicks, or the ball the girl kicks, or even more scrambly, the girl the kicks the ball, and so on. And he did that for a hundred times for every sentence in all, every one of these 37 languages. And what we observed was that languages tend to minimize the dependency distances between the words in the real texts compared to these baseline random order texts. That was true in every single language, all 37 languages, in English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, Persian, even Latin and ancient Greek. Okay, so humans have this very strong bias in their language systems to put words that go together in their meaning close together in the linear string. This is actually the first true cross-linguistic syntactic universal that anyone's ever observed. If, in, in the syntax, you know, if you happen to be familiar with Chomsky's universal grammar hypothesis, this is not one of those. Okay, uh, that hypothesis uh, says that there aren't any functional universals. This, and this is a functional universal. There's a function here is to maximize efficiency of memory use in the, in the grammar. Okay, so, so let's go on to the third uh, sort, uh, kind of efficiency that I wanted to talk about. And that has got to do with noise, okay? Normal language processing is difficult because speakers make lots of errors, okay? Uh, 
They start sentences that they don't finish. They choose the wrong words. They fill pauses with um and uh and like. Uh, and they don't finish sentences, okay? All of this happens, that makes it hard for the comprehender, okay? The comprehender on the other side, it's difficult for them to figure out what it is was being said because of these errors, but even for other reasons it's hard, because there's background noise, uh, and because of differences in accents, we don't all talk the same way, and, and because we're not always paying full attention to what my comprehending partner, my speech partner is saying, okay? So for these reasons, humans have to uh, it's, it's a guessing game when I'm listening to you and guessing, I'm trying to guess what it is you said given what I thought you, what, what I thought you said, what, what it is that you meant given what I thought you said, okay? And, uh, but we're really good at it, okay? And the way that we're really good at it in part is that we fill in things that we thought you probably said even if you didn't, okay? And so for example, if I were to say the mother gave the candle to the daughter, you'll probably infer that I meant to say two there. Maybe I did or maybe I didn't. It would be hard for you to know because it makes a lot more sense if that little word was just missing. So what we do is infer the existence of sounds and words that make the, that make the, the, the meaning of the, of the language more plausible, okay? And we do that uh, probably because it's a noisy background, <laughs> and so I have to, I don't always know what you're saying. Okay, so I'm gonna rely on that, this idea that in noisy comprehension, and noisy understanding, we often have to infer, we don't hear everything, we miss stuff, okay? And now I'm gonna talk about how the, the word orders of the world might be different and how that might affect it, that idea might affect it, okay? So first thing, I need to tell you about how the word orders of the world look. And the way I'm gonna do that is just show you a little video, and I'm gonna ask you to think to yourself how you would describe this little video. Very short, okay? And you probably, if you speak English, you'd think it's like, oh, the boy kicked the ball, or the boy is kicking the ball, something like that. That's a agent subject first. You said boy, you think, think to yourself boy. Then kick is second, the verb is second, and finally the patient, the object last, the ball, okay? The word order in English is actually a very common word order around, around the world's languages. It's subject first, the agent, verb medial, verb comes in between. It's English, but it's French, Spanish, it's Chinese, Swahili, and hundreds of others. Now, if you happen, to have spoke, you happen to be a native speaker of a language like Turkish or Persian or Japanese, you probably thought of it in a different way, okay? You probably thought, oh, boy, ball, kicks, not boy, kicks, ball, okay? Because these languages are all what are what's called verb final. They're still subject first, but now the verb comes at the end. And there's tons of those as well. So let's look how languages, now we sort of know what I'm talking about for word order, how those kinds of word orders are distributed around the world. Okay, this figure um, is where, from where languages were originated. Okay, so on North America, you've got Native American languages. English is on England, okay? Uh, and what you notice when you look at that is that there's a lot of blue and red dots, mostly blue and red dots. That's mostly languages like English and Chinese. Those are subject initial, verb medial, and mostly languages like Japanese, which are subject initial, verb final. That's the dominant number of, of languages by far in the world's languages. Okay, so I want to offer an explanation for this, okay? And, and the explanation is going to come in two parts, and part of it's communication theory. The first part is that maybe one of these word orders is the most simple conceptual word order for people to think about, and that happens to be, we think it's Japanese, okay? Japanese or Korean or Turkish, it's the verb final word order. Why do we think that? Well, it looks like um, languages like that, uh, um, there are languages that, that have been invented sort of out of whole cloth with no precursors, which are sign languages, all of which are subject initial, verb final. Okay, those la when you don't have any other, other languages to, 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 f to come from, they, they seem to be created as subject initial, verb final. Okay, that's one of the pieces of evidence. There's, a, there's other pieces of evidence to think that that language word order, verb final, is kind of the most easy. Now, why do we go to verb medial? Where is, the, like, why, why Chinese and English and so on? Well, imagine I, I want to convey the meaning to you of this event, okay? This event here is a girl kissing a boy. And I want to do it in a verb final code. I want to do it in Japanese. So I say, girl, boy, kiss, okay? But remember what I said before, there's a chance for information loss in the channel. And so when I say, girl, boy, kiss, maybe I lose one of those words. You don't hear all of them. And all you heard was girl kiss, okay? So all you heard was girl kiss. Well, can you get back the meaning of that event? Actually, no, it's kind of hard. 
girl kiss is now consistent not only with this event, but also with boy-girl kiss. You might have missed boy in either one of those, and just so you just don't know how the girl is taking part in this event. Okay? I bring this up because it's very different for a verb, verb medial language. So imagine now that I'm speaking Chinese or English. Okay? When I'm and so now instead of girl-boy kiss, I say girl-kiss boy. Same thing happens. I say girl-kiss boy, I lose some information. All I heard was girl-kiss. I can pick the right picture because uh, there's, that's the right picture. I lost boy, but now I know that the agent subject thing is the one on the left of the verb. Or I, heard, I just heard kiss boy. Same thing, I can pick the right picture. So the reason this is, this, that, that the verb medial is more robust to information transfer is that the verb comes between these arguments and that so it's, it's informative. Where it occurs is informative in the meaning. Okay? Okay, so now we've got an explanation for why languages look the way they do, okay? You've got some conceptual, simple word order like Japanese, which is verb final, and then you have shifts to verb medial word orders, which, um, which is caused by information theory, okay? And, and I like verb medial. But now you're thinking to yourself, look, if verb medial is the most efficient, then why aren't all languages verb medial? That's a very good question, okay? It turns out there's a very simple answer. And the simple answer is that there's another way to convey these complicated meanings other than word order, and that is by adding a little bit of a word, a morph morphological ending, onto the nouns in these verb final languages, and that's called case marking. So in Japanese, you actually don't just say girl, boy, kiss. What you say is girl subject, boy object, kiss. So those are like parody bits in information theory. It's redundant bits of information which allow us to keep this simple code for ourselves. And so now if I lose one of those nouns, so instead I say, I hear girl subject kiss, I lost boy in the middle there, I, I know what the agent is. It's the one that's marked with the subject. I have to say a little more, I have to add that extra word, but I have a more redundant code. So we can evaluate this hypothesis by looking across the world's languages. Here are a bunch of verb final languages, okay? I, you use a whole bunch of languages you probably know and a bunch of ones you don't. There's hundreds of verb final languages. And now we can see how are, th how are those case marked. Turns out that about 70% of them are case marked. Most of these languages are case marked. The verb medial languages, think of a bunch of those in your head, English, Chinese, and Spanish, and French, and so on. And um, it turns out most of those are not case marked. Only a small percentage, maybe 20%, according to typologist Matt Dreyer, are case marked. So what we see here is that language might be well designed for communication because we have the most simple word order sub with, with, the with the verb at the end, also with this uh, parity bit, the case marking. With most of those languages have that. They can keep that word order because they have the parity bit. And verb medial word orders don't need it, and so they, they drop the, um, the case marking. So what I've told you here is that contrary to popular belief in the old linguistics literature, languages do seem to be designed for efficient use. And I've given you three ways in which that might be the case. First, that words are short in predictable positions. So I don't have to say much. I only have to say long words in very unpredictable locations. Second, the order of the words is efficient in human memory. Words that go to close together in meaning usually appear linearly close together, and that's true across all languages. And finally, the order of words is robust to noise. Languages are mostly either verb final, final with case marking or verb medial without. And I want to thank you for your attention in English, but also in a bunch of verb final case marking languages and a bunch of verb medial non-case marking languages. Thank you. Can I hit that? Okay,